Dr. Takhar is going to talk about the liquid gold. We've been, um, we started having discussion in the beginning. Uh, she is the uh, uh, assistant professor at Division of Nephrology at UTESCA, and she's our director of the clinical operations. Dr. Takhar. Good afternoon, and thank you for staying for the last talk of the day. Hopefully, it will be worth your time. And thanks to the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity to speak today. So I've been asked to speak on my patient is already on dialysis. Do I still need to worry about protecting their kidneys? I hope in the next 20, 25 minutes, I can convince you that, yes, you still need to worry about protecting their kidneys. So I don't have any financial disclosures. And a quick outline of the talk, three questions I'll try to answer today. Why does residual renal function matter? How does it matter? And what we could do potentially to preserve residual renal function? So very simplistically, what is residual renal function? So this is the ability of your diseased ESRD kidneys to still be able to excrete solute and fluid by means of glomerular filtration or tubular secretion. What are some of the ways we could assess residual kidney function? Uh, it could be measured or estimated by urinary clearance of urea or creatinine, or sometimes an average of the two considering the limitations of either alone. You could use urine volume as a surrogate, and typically at least a urine volume of 100 ml is considered relevant. And sometimes serum markers that are not well dialyzed, such as serum beta-2 microglobulin, uh, cystatin C, or beta-trace protein, they can be measured. So as most of us are aware, increasing dialysis dose in end-stage renal disease patients, whether it is peritoneal dialysis dose or hemodialysis dose, above a certain threshold has not been associated with survival advantage. Conversely, the suggestion that residual kidney function may have a survival benefit came in the 1990s from an initial observational trial that ran over three years. Patients with some degree of residual kidney function were twice as likely to be alive at three years compared to those without. Adding on to the evidence, we uh, look at the CAN-USA study, which was a dosing trial for peritoneal dialysis. This was a prospective observational cohort study where initial suggestion was that the total dialysis dose, which was a sum of renal as well as peritoneal dialysis, uh, peritoneal clearance, was associated with survival. However, later on, reanalysis of about 600 patients from the study, patients who had data on urinary uh, clearance, showed that the survival benefit came entirely from renal and not from peritoneal uh, clearance. As highlighted here, each five liters per week increase in your intrinsic GFR, which in this study was urea clearance, was associated with 12% less odds of dying. Conversely, a in similar increase in creatinine clearance by peritoneal clearance did not conf confer that survival benefit. Similar observations were seen in Edimex, which was a prospective randomized control trial in 965 peritoneal dialysis patients. And similar observation was made in the Netherlands cooperative study on adequacy of dialysis. Again, each one ml, so very negligible residual renal function, each one ml increase in residual GFR, 12% lower odds of dying. Uh, again, no effect of peritoneal clearance. So a variety of different settings, different demographics confirmed the data in peritoneal dialysis patients. How about hemo? So the largest and most convincing evidence comes from the CHOICE study. This was an observational study of 734 incident hemo patients across 81 clinics in the United States. One simple question, do you make urine at least one cup or more per day? So 250 ml or more urine per day. Patients got asked the same question at dialysis initiation and then at one year after dialysis initiation. About 84% patients had the urine output at baseline, and about a third had preserved renal, uh, urinary output at a year. So when you look at those who had preserved urine output at a year, com oh, sorry, yeah, how do I go back? Okay. So when you compare the patients with urine output to, at one year compared to those without, the hazards ratio for dying was about 30% lower. Now, not only there seems to be an association of residual kidney function with survival, 
there also seems to be sort of a dose response relationship. So this study comes from uh, a four-year study of patients, more than 6,500 patients who started dialysis over a four-year pe period and had urea clearance data at baseline as well as at a year after dialysis start. The goal of the study was to see whether the annual rate of decline of their renal function was associated with survival. And I want you to focus on curve D. This is a fully adjusted model that was adjusted for a variety of demographic and clinical variables that could perhaps affect survival. So patients who had the least, uh, the most GFR decline tended to also have the worst mortality compared to ones, so this is the rate of uh, decline in urea clearance, this is your hazards ratio for dying. So the, the more your annual decline in GFR is, the worse your mortality is. A small subset of patients uh, tended to gain, regain some of the renal function over time, which is again well associated due to recovery of some degree of acute renal failure or heart failure at the time of dialysis in initiation. And these patients tended to do the best in terms of survival, okay? So the first question, why does it matter? The most important answer is it is associated with improved survival. Now let's talk about how, it, how could it potentially affect the survival benefit. Whether it's related to better clearance of some of the uremic solute and toxins, whether it's associated with preserved urine output and therefore preserved volume better volume control, whether it is a lower inflammatory state whether it is due to be, uh, better vascular function or it's just a bystander, it's just a marker of an overall healthier status, the healthy patients tend to maintain their kidney function, okay? So let's talk about clearance. Now, even when the residual kidney function is negligible, you can have significant clearance of the uremic solute because of the continuous nature of this compared to intermittent with our dialysis modality as well as poor dialyzability of some of the larger protein-bound solutes that we consider as the true uremic toxins, okay? So this is the perfect example of how negligible residual kidney function can contribute towards significant clearance of toxins. So this was actually presented as an abstract uh, in the Kidney Week last year. So they actually analyzed hemo participants. Just as a refresher, hemo was a... Uh, a dialysis dose study where they compared effect of high versus low dose dialysis and overall a high dose of dialysis did not confer survival benefit. Now these authors took the same hemo population. One of the exclusion criteria for hemo study was uh, residual kidney function above 1.5 mil per minute per 1.73 meter square. So all of these patients had by definition negligible to no regional function. So they identified in the hemo cohort, a third patients had minimal residual kidney function. However, the other two-third were aneuric and had no renal function. The mean renal function in the ones who did have some was 0.7 mil per minute per 1.73 meter square urea clearance. So seven out of the eight identified and measured uremic toxins in plasma measured lower in those with kidney function compared to those without. So this is 0.7 ml per minute of urea clearance, and yet we are seeing significant decline in several of the measured uremic toxins. So clearance definitely helps. Let's talk about volume. So the two clinical correlates of volume, I would say, are blood pressure and left ventricular hypertrophy, right? So the association of residual kidney function with blood pressure has been demonstrated initially in this study of peritoneal dialysis patients. Again, a retrospective study, residual kidney function in addition to duration of hypertension and age was associated with degree of BP control. How about preserved urine output? Yes, patients may perhaps have lower interdialytic weight gain, and yes, that was demonstrated in this study. This was a 15-year retrospective analysis of 650 incident dialysis patients. So patients with residual renal function at any time point tend to have about uh, half the interdialytic weight gain and therefore lower ultrafiltration requirements and maybe that's a cardiovascular risk we are managing there. Again, I want to highlight the residual kidney function as was defined by urea clearance here and is fairly minimal, more than one mil versus less than one mil. So every ml counts. So how about 
we, we said the blood pressure that tends to be better, the interdialytic weight gain, and perhaps long-term volume management tends to be better. How about the left ventricular hypertrophy? So again, cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of mortality in end-stage renal disease, of which LVH strikes as a prominent risk factor. Patients with LVH tend to have eight to nine-fold higher risk of sudden cardiac death compared to those without LVH. So in this study, peritoneal dialysis patients, roughly around 150 patients, they had their residual GFR compared to association studied with left ventricular mass index measured by ultrasound. And as you can see, as the residual GFR goes up, you tend to have a lower left ventricular mass index. So perhaps by a better blood pressure control, better control of the chronic volume overload that is so prevalent in our dialysis patients, we are affecting the left ventricular hypertrophy sum. How about vascular disease? Let's talk about some of the known risk factors for vascular disease in dialysis patients. Hyperphosphatemia is a known risk factor in dialysis patients for vascular disease. Phosphorus control was measured by 24-hour uh, urinary phosphorus excretion in a small study. And the renal phosphorus excretion in patients who were making as little as 100 cc's of urine per day was twice as much compared to those who were not. And actually, the weekly phosphorus excretion in those with minimal urinary output was equivalent to one standard dialysis session. So over time, we probably are causing significant phosphorus removal. Atherosclerosis, as described by carotid artery media thickness or presence of a plaque, lower in patients with RKF compared to those without. And similarly, many studies, including the CHOICE study that we recently reviewed, showed lower level of inflammatory markers such as CRP, interleukin-6, et cetera. Several studies have shown that in patients with preserved renal function. So what does that correlate to? Let's talk about endothelial function. So we talked about risk factors of vascular disease. Does endothelial function do better? So this is a study of 72 peritoneal dialysis patients. Endothelial function or dysfunction was assessed by flow-mediated dilatation of the brachial artery. So patients had their three blood pressure readings done at baseline. An average of the systolic was recorded. The BP cuff was inflated 50 millimeters above that for five minutes, and then it was released to cause reactive hyperemia. So pre-hyperemia um, and post, brachial artery diameter and flow velocities were measured, and uh, a flow-mediated dilatation percentage was calculated. The median was about 2.4%, and patients got divided into two groups compared, depending upon if their FMD was above median or it was below median. Turns out patients with FMD above median were the ones who had better residual renal function compared to those with lower FMD. So by controlling the vascular risk factors, perhaps we are affecting the vascular function and perhaps we're affecting the outcomes. So very simplistic summary of so far what we've discussed, how it may affect your survival. Maybe it's due to control of the risk factors for left ventricular hypertrophy, perhaps due to improvement in risk factors for endothelial dysfunction, and perhaps due to improvement in the malnutrition inflammation complex, which all three of these are independent risk factors of mortality in a dialysis patient. Some of the softer outcomes, anemia. So as would, it would make sense, when you have residual kidney function, you probably conserve some of your ability to secrete erythropoietin. Conversely, you're in a lower inflammatory state, so maybe your EPO, uh, responsiveness is better. And that has been demonstrated in several studies, including CHOICE. In the CHOICE cohort, average EPO requirement per week was 12,000 units lower in patients with residual kidney function compared to those without. Similar data was seen in the other study we reviewed, another retrospective analysis of patients with RKF. Higher serum albumin and protein catabolism rates, so nutritive indices, tend to be better in patients with residual kidney function and quality of life. Both in hemo and in PD, several studies have demonstrated several quality of life indices, they tend to be better. Whether this is related to improved nutrition, due to improved anemia, lower requirement for phosphorus binders, we don't know, but this has been re repeatedly demonstrated. So now the most important question, is this a mere association or perhaps there's a signal towards causation?
So all the data we've reviewed so far is observational data, which as we know, does not suggest causality. Like we said, it may just tell us these patients are healthier to begin with, that's why they're doing better. So we go through the Hills criteria that may suggest causality in observational study, and many of the studies we've reviewed tend to meet majority of these criteria. Temporality, the strength, strength of association, a dose-response sort of relationship, consistency across different demogra demographics and dialysis modalities, and it certainly makes biological sense why RKF, why preserved residual kidney function may you know, lead to better outcomes. Again, we do not yet have an experimental design study where preserved kidney function, where efforts towards preserving kidney function leads on to improved survival. So now that we know that residual kidney function is very strongly associated with uh, several of the hard outcomes, what can we do to preserve it? Now many of the factors, many of the risk factors for residual kidney function decline are non-modifiable. Non-white rays, presence of heart failure at baseline, presence of diabetes, proteinuria, there's nothing we can do about that. So let's talk about uh, some of the fa modifiable factors very quickly. We'll touch upon dialysis modality, frequency, effect of volume depletion, and some of the common medications. So dialysis modality, peritoneal versus hemodialysis, this particular data comes from a one-year follow-up of over 500 patients, hemo and PD. Patients had a baseline GFR, again, urea clearance measured at baseline, zero to four weeks before dialysis start, and then at three, six, nine, and 12 month intervals. At each of these measured time intervals, residual kidney function was preserved better in PD patients by roughly about 30% than in hemo. Several subsequent studies have suggested similar association, Conversely, one of the more recent studies suggests otherwise. So in this study, newer hemodialysis techniques were utilized, and what I mean by that is the dialysis membranes were biocompatible, polysulfone membranes. Dialysate that was used was ultra-pure, which so far is not a standard practice in the United States, but it is in Europe, and bicarbonate-based buffer. So in this four-year study, when you look at the GFR decline, again indicated by urea clearance, the curve in hemo versus PD, fairly identical. Still looking at the overall data, I would say there is some suggestion, probably peritoneal dialysis helps preserve residual kidney function early on after dialysis start. However, there is no long-term survival difference between hemo and peritoneal dialysis, so still the predominant factor dictating your choice of Therapy should be lifestyle reasons. Incremental dialysis. So this is something in hemo that's gaining attention in the last five to seven years. In peritoneal dialysis, it's fairly standard practice for us nephrologists to take into account the residual kidney function while prescribing dialysis dose. And as patients lose residual kidney function, we adjust the peritoneal dialysis dose to an equivalent amount. In hemo, we've had a one-size-fits-all approach. Every patient who starts, starts with a thrice a week, four hours each time kind of treatment. So there is some idea that every time we expose the patient to a dialysis treatment, they are exposed to the membrane and the inflammatory cascade from that, as well as the potential of hypotensive events during each treatment. So perhaps lower frequency of dialysis may be better. So this is one of the largest studies on the subject, and what they did is they identified patients who did incremental dialysis. And what I mean by that, so patients in the first quarter or the first 90 days of being called ESRD and starting hemo had to have at least a continuous six week period where they received twice a week dialysis before moving on to the standard thrice a week. And these were compared with matched cohort of patients who started dialysis with a conventional approach, roughly 8,000 of those. These were matched including for their residual kidney function. At baseline, as you can see, the uh, urea clearance, so this is the residual renal urea clearance, was fairly similar. Over time, at five quarters, which is roughly 15 months, by an incremental approach, um, they tended to maintain their urea clearance better compared to with the conventional approach. Similar data seen with urine volume, better preservation of urine volume at 15 months compared to a conventional approach. When you look at survival, survival, 
Patients dialyzed with an incremental approach did not seem to do worse compared to those who got the conventional dialysis. One caveat, when they did subgroup analysis of those with low intrinsic renal urea clearance at baseline, patients whose baseline urea clearance was under three mil, they did have a higher odds of dying at five quarters. The odds ratio in those patients was 1.6, or roughly 60% higher odds of dying at a year if those patients got dialyzed with an incremental approach. Now, as it would make sense, Incremental approach is worth a try, but just like in PD, would require strong participation from the patient and the nephrologist. It would require willingness to do timed urine collections and adjustment of the dialysis dose as the residual kidney function goes down. Intradilytic hypotension as intuitive, as well as clinical episodes of hypovolemia are associated with kidney function decline and should be avoided. Conversely, Permissive hypervolemia, in this particular study, they actually allowed hypervolemia by, as measured by bioimpedance analysis. That did not help preserve residual kidney function and actually could potentially cause more harm, such as hypertension, left ventricular hypertrophy. So permissively, hypervolemia should not be allowed with the goal to preserve re residual kidney function. ACE inhibitors and ARBs, the answer is fairly consistent and clear in peritoneal patients. On the left is Ramipril, on the right is Valsartan. So Ramipril compared to the control group, the probability of anuria at one year was lower with Ramipril control to, uh, compared to control patients for a similar degree of blood pressure control. Similar things with uh, Valsartan versus control. The renal clearance at two years better maintained with Valsartan compared to those with control. On HEMO, the association studies suggest sort of mixed data, some studies suggesting a beneficial effect, others suggesting none. The only randomized control trial there is, uh, comparing herbisartan to placebo, no difference in GFR or urine volume at a year. So overall, in PD patients, it's fairly standard for us to uh, routinely utilize ACE and ARBs as first-line antihypertensive. Anti in HEMO, oftentimes the choice is driven by uh, pressing need for other antihypertensives, and usually because beta blockers have a better uh, suggestion of cardiovascular mortality reduction, typically beta blockers tend to be our first line of therapy uh, for blood pressure control in hemo. How about diuretics? So this comes from, again, peritoneal dialysis patients. 60 patients, 61 patients got randomized into receiving high-dose furosemide versus placebo. At one year, Patients who got furosemide tended to maintain urine output better compared to the ones who did not. Their urine output dropped over time, but their measured urea or creatinine clearance was no different. So the utility of diuretics in patients on, uh, with end-stage renal disease is primarily to manage volume, hypertension, and interdialytic weight gain, but no effect on residual kidney function. So some of the newer biocompatible peritoneal dialysis solutions, so these are low P, uh, the neutral pH, low glucose degradation product uh, solutions. Mixed data on that with an overall small uh, benefit suggestion from meta-analysis. Again, not a routine practice yet in the United States. So some of the common nephrotoxic medications, again, small, um, short-term, uh, studies with the aminoglycosides do not suggest harm, but I think uh, for what we know of so far, repeated doses and long-term usage of aminoglycosides should be avoided. Uh, similarly, non-steroidals should be avoided as much as possible. Iodinated contrast, again, we still want to use our standard precautions in those with preserved renal function. The only data that there is on iodinated contrast is on 36 peritoneal dialysis patients who received contrast for a variety of settings, including for coronary, thoracic, and renal um, angiograms. Average dose of contrast, a volume of contrast, was 104 mils. In those patients, a GFR was measured pre-contrast and two weeks post-contrast and was not different. It was around 7 mil. But again, the big criticism is it's one study, it's short, um, short, um, and small, and also, when we expect the maximum decline in GFR, the, the urea or creatinine clearance were not measured 24 to 48 hours after contrast administration. Um, immunosuppression should be continued at low doses in those with failed kidney transplants returning to uh, dialysis. 
both for preserv preservation of RKF as well as some survival benefits. So in summary, I would like to reiterate that for any treating nephrologist, the two major goals for our patients are one, to improve their survival, and two, to improve their quality of life. Hopefully, I've convinced you that preserving residual kidney function helps us achieve both of those goals, so we should constantly be addressing the modifiable risk factors towards preserving kidney function. Thank you.